we can start the report. Please begin. All right. Uh, well, welcome everyone uh, to the March edition 2023 of the ISPD uh, West Coast Home Dialysis Journal Club. Just wanted to acknowledge uh, Dr. Golper, who's here in the audience, who's the, uh, among many other things, the immediate past president of the North American chapter of the ISPD, who uh, I think really conceived of these, uh, these journal clubs. Sorry about my ambulance siren in the background. Um, also wanted to uh, welcome Dr. Yuvaram Reddy, who I see uh, has joined, who is an assistant professor uh, in the Renal Electrolyte and Hypertension Division at the Perlman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania, who uh, is uh, the senior author of the article that we're going to be discussing today. So thanks so much, Dr. Reddy, for joining us. Uh, Dr. Jenny Shen, who co-leads this West Coast Journal Club with me, is running a few minutes late. Uh, but she will be joining us uh, in a few minutes. And uh, I also now wanted to introduce our uh, presenter this morning, Dr. Amal Patel, who is the Peckham Home Dialysis and Policy Leadership Fellow here at the University of Washington uh, in Seattle, who's going to be launching our discussion. So uh, go ahead, Amal. All right. Thanks, Dr. Rivara. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a paper that was recently published last month um, as a perspective piece in Jason um, titled Deprescribing KT over V in Perineal Dialysis in the United States, um, a path forward to adopting international standards for dialysis advocacy. So in this talk, I'll be quickly outlining a few things. First is review the literature leading up to the development of the target KT over V. Second is I'll be listing some of the different practice guidelines and how they've changed over time. Then I'll describe the current policies per pertaining to the current target K K K K V as it stands right now with CMS and discuss a path forward for policy change. So the first thing I wanna talk about is K T V and it's a unitless ratio intended to measure uremic toxins. And for the most part, it's a, it's a clearance of, of urea over a fixed period of time over the volume of distribution of urea, where, where urea is a surrogate marker of the uremic toxins, which we're actually trying to clear. And the, that K, the clearance of urea, can, can be clearance of dialysis or native kidney. So the point I want to make is that we can have a K2 of V of dialysis or a K2 V of the kidneys. And that's an important concept to know because a lot of the studies that I'm about to present talk about the different types of K2V of dialysis and K2V of the kidney. So before going into the different studies, I first want to highlight the initial 1996 NKF KDOKI guidelines, which were published 27 years ago. And in these guidelines for the weekly dose of CAPD, it states that the, the delivered dose should be a total k 2 v of at least 2.0 um, per week or at least a creatinine clearance of 60 liters per week. And the rationale of this is based on um, prim a primarily theoretical construct that, that supports this as well as some cohort studies. And what's important to know is that there's also a separate guideline for the weekly dose of NIPD and CCPD, and this is actually based on opinion. So in this same year, the CAN-USA study came out in 1996, and this was a multi-center observational prospective study of 680 patients on CAPD. And really what they measured is over a two-year period of time of patients on CAPD, they looked at mortality, technique failure, and hospitalization based on the adequacy of dialysis. And what some people may not know is actually the, the nutritional status as well. For the sake of this talk, I'll be focusing on the adequacy of dialysis, which was measured as a total weekly KTRV, a total weekly creatinine clearance, and serum beta-2 microglobulin. So this is a table kind of out, outlining the progression of patients over the two-year time period. And what you can note is that over this 24-month period, the total KTRV of these patients did decrease by some amount from 2.38 to 1. To 1.99, but in reality, this was primarily driven by the renal KT over V, which you can see at time zero, it was 0 0.71, and then at 24 months, it was 0 0.28. And, 
And really the paired Neo K tier for V stayed pretty much the same. And what this shows is that in this period, the hazard ratio shows such that the K tier for V, as it increases every decimal point, there's a 6% decrease in the relative risk of death. They also did, um, uh, there was also a, um, an expected two-year patient survival um, according to the um, according to different K two reviews that were uh, that were estimated, and what you can see is that with every increase in K two V, there's also an increase in survival. But the main point I want to make is that in this study, the change in K two V over the twenty four month period of time was really based on the renal K two V, whereas the peritoneal K K two V had no significant change. Nevertheless, the conclusions of the CAN-USA study showed that every decimal point higher in k v was associated with a 6% decrease in relative risk of death. And further, furthermore, a k v of 2.1 had a higher two-year mortality than what was currently observed at that time in North America. And I guess, um, conveniently, this 2.1 value fits within the theoretical the theoretical construct of 2 to 2.1, which was outlined in the Kedoki guidelines in, um, in 1996. Thus, they stated in this paper, it's reasonable to provide a high, as, as high a dialysis dose as feasible, with the target being 2.1. The caveat, though, is that this is under the assumption that peritoneal KT over V equals renal KT over V. Now, in 2001, a few years later, this data was actually reanalyzed, kind of challenging the assumption of renal KTRV equals peritoneal KTRV. And they studied the relationship between residual kidney function and patient survival using the same data. And in this table, the data presented wasn't any different, but it was looked at in a different frame of reference. So you can see that the residual GFR and the and the peritoneal creatinine clearance is, is no differently presented than how the original Can USA paper was, was presented. But what's also seen is that over a 24 month period of time, the, the residual urine volume actually decreases and compensatorily the net peritoneal ultrafiltration increases. What this, what this reanalysis showed was when, when the peritoneal clearances in GFR are, 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 are looked at as time-dependent covariates, you'll see that on the left, left-hand side, there is the re, there is a relationship between the residual kidney function GFR and a decrease of relative risk of death as your GFR increases. And this is not seen with peritoneal clearance on the left-hand side of the table. On the right-hand side, urine volume was actually put in as a time dependent time-dependent covariate. And interestingly enough, it showed a very drastic um, change as, as you increase your urine volume, you have a significant relative risk decrease of, of death. Now this kind of offset the value such that now, now the residual GFR didn't show a significant difference. And the paper goes into reasons as to why or why, or why not this was seen, uh, but nevertheless, there's no strong conclusion based on this, uh, based on this finding. The main point I want to make is that this reanalysis re really reaffirmed the idea that renal clearance is perhaps more important than perineal clearance. So the conclusions from, the, from this reanalysis re essentially stated what I just said um, about residual kidney function potentially being more important than perineal clearance. But the important thing about CANUSA is that this is an observational study, um, which which used statistical analysis, but it wasn't an actually an experiment. So the question is, can this actually be tested? So a year, a year later, a study in Mexico um, called the Atomex study was a prospective randomized controlled trial to study the effect of increasing peritoneal clearance and mortality. This was a cohort of 965 patients split into two groups, an intervention group, which received a modified PD prescription of 60 liters per week. Note that this target wasn't a KTRV, it was a total clearance per week. And the control group had no change, change in the prescription. 
the primary outcome was death. The main thing I wanna point out in the baseline characteristics of these two co cohorts is that 50% of these patients at the very bottom had no residual function. Essentially, they were a network. And this is important because this study is trying to study the effects of peritoneal flares. So as, so as little of renal contribution there is, the more conclusions we can make of peritoneal clearance on the survival um, as this study is um, um, looking at. This, this chart shows that at the very beginning of the study, both the intervention and the control group started with an average peritoneal clearance of around 1.6. And then the treated group had a total peritoneal clearance of, of or, or a delivered peritoneal clearance of 60 liters, which averaged a peritoneal K, K, KTRV of 2.1 versus a control average perineal KTV of 1.7. So one could say that this is essentially a study of perineal KTV averaging around 2.1 versus 1.7 over a 28 month uh, time period. The study showed no significant um, change in uh, change in peritoneal, uh, change, change in patient mortality. Some of the interesting outcomes when done um, through regression analysis was that the renal KTRV showed with every decimal increase, there was actually a decrease 6% relative risk of death. And that's the same, that's the same increment that was seen in the observational KNUSA study. And as expected, the peritoneal KTRV actually had no significant change in your in the relative risk, risk of death. So the conclusions of the ADAMX trial showed that there was no survival advantage with solely increasing peritoneal clearance, which then brings the question to, it doesn't seem as if there's an optimal dose of peritoneal clearance. What's the minimum dose that can be prescribed? So how low can peritoneal clearance actually be prescribed until anything different is seen? which led to a study in 2003 by, by, by Lowe, pu published in KI, colloquially known as the Hong Kong study. And this was the effect of KTRV on survival and clinical outcomes in CAD patients, um, CAPD patients. And this was a randomized prospective study divided into three groups. Group A had a, had a, um, had a total KTRV of 1.5 to 1.7, B had 1.7 to 2.0, and C had more than 2.0. This was the total KTRV. The primary endpoints of the study were death, transfer to hemodialysis, and withdrawal of the study. The important point I want to make, though, is that this study was powered to death in the same manner that it would show a magnitude of survival similar to CAN USA. So for all intents and purposes, this patient, this, this, this study was powered towards the primary endpoint of death. Between the three groups that were studied, there were essentially no significant differences at time zero. Their total KTRV, peritoneal KTRV and renal KTRV were um, relatively similar. Over time though, you can see that between A, B, and C, the total KTRV was, was, was as expected between 1.5 to 1.7 in A, 1.7 to 2 in B, and then a around two to above two in C. The renal KTRV or residual function had no change within either group and the peritoneal KTRV to compensate for the residual kidney loss was the highest in C and the lowest in A to maintain that total KTRV target. When going through the clinical outcomes, there is no significant difference in death. But, uh, but what I want to point everyone's attention to is the, the withdrawal from the study. So each cohort had about 100 patients, a little over 100 patients, and 30 patients withdrew from the group A, which was the lowest target KTRV, and the least amount of patients from the B group, and a little bit more from the C group. And what you can see is that in the A group, with the least delivered dose of KTRV, the reasons for, for, for withdrawal were, were primary inadequate dialysis and 
inadequate ultrafiltration. But interestingly enough, for the C group that had the highest delivered dose of dialysis, it seemed like the withdrawal was primarily from patients due to refusal to increase peritoneal dialysis. Um, but nevertheless, the, the question then comes, what exactly was it about group A that had an inadequate dialysis? And this group, and, and the study also looked at the hemoglobin levels and the doses of EPO um, over the three cohorts. And what you can see is that at month 31 for the A cohort, about half of the patients were on EPO, whereas in the group B was 18 and C was 28. So perhaps in the group A cohort, if you're having decreased peritoneal clearance, perhaps from a pathophysiological standpoint, is there some sort of uremic component that is leading to more EPO usage? And this led to some of the conclusions made from the Hong Kong study, which is, first of all, there was no significant difference in survival between KT over B cohorts, noting that this study was powered for survival, um, not for withdrawal. A KT over V of less than 1.7 had more clinical problems which was outlined through the withdrawal, withdrawal of the study and more increases in EPO. And a K2V of more than two didn't have any advantages. So ultimately, what this paper wrote was that a minimum K2V should be 1.7 and kept between 1.7 and 2.0. This led to three years later, K KDOKI updating their guidelines and acknowledging that their prior guideline was 2.0, but now there's increasing evidence to show a more importance on residual kidney function. Therefore, they modify their guidelines to say that the minimal delivered dose should be at least 1.7 per week based on the studies that we know thus far. And these changes have not been, been made to KDOKI since, since 2006, and these are the latest KDOKI guidelines. ISPD, however, has been progressively changing their stance on how they view KTRV and the KTRV target. So in 2009, they made an update on their 2005 guidelines, which stated that there is no evidence that increasing weekly KTRV provides any survival advantage, and that was a grade 1B recommendation. The remainder are practice points, not actually grade recommendations. And bullet point number Number two states that there's an evidence that a weekly k v less than 1.7 is associated with increased morbidity, which is primarily based on the Hong Kong study that I just talked about with 100 patients being the cohort. And this is a practice point. And going through the ISPD guidelines even further, they lay out a summary of studies and how it pertains to a target k v and the point I want to make is that most of these studies were observational and are not large studies, which leads to ISPD's most recent guidelines in 2020, which is actually the document of prescribing high quality and goal directed PD, which further de emphasizes the single cutoff target goal of K2 V, which has been, um, which has been have been the standard for the past 20 some odd years. And given the uncertainty of, of the estimation of V and the evidence that we know of K, the KT over V, prescribed dialysis dose should be based on the patient's symptoms, biomedical parameters, and treatment goals, as opposed to just a single cutoff value. So this leads me to the paper that I'm gonna to describe today which is deprescribing de K2 for V target and peritoneal dialysis in the United States, a path towards adopting international standards for dialysis advocacy. And I think the authors of this paper are really trying to compare the United States as it pertains to the CMS target of K2 V and the international standards, specifically the ISPD guidelines and some of the discrepancies um, between these two recommendations or guidelines. So first and foremost, why change the CMS measure of that target KTRV of 1.7? Well, we all know in 2019, the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative um, was, was, was put out and signed. And one of the, one of the many things um, 
encourage the use of home dialysis um, in um, in in patients with 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 the ESRD, and and furthermore, this year, see 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 actually wrote seeking advice on how they can deliver best quality of care to patients on home dialysis. And I'll talk about this in a second, but although some measures in the ESRD QIP may apply to dialysis facilities, they don't actually apply to home dialysis. And with the ESRD QIP, I'll talk about it in a second, but essentially lead to many facilities not being eligible for the QIP measures. Um, as opposed to facilities that only provide in-center hemodialysis. Um, going back to this second bullet point, though, where CMS is asking for, for comments on, um, on how to best deliver care for home dialysis, the National Kidney Foundation actually took C CMS on this and wrote a letter to CMS, essentially, stating some of the things that that they would recommend or at least acknowledge when it comes to taking care of home dialysis patients. And the first thing was access to care to patients on home dialysis, retaining home, retaining patients on home dialysis, home satisfaction, and quality of life. The important thing is though, is that nowhere in this is K2V actually mentioned or the implications on modality of satisfaction and quality of life. And I think this best hits home in an excerpt of the article that actually states that dialysis facilities are 13 times more likely to miss k review targets for PD as opposed to HD for 10% of their patients, which one can, can presume that this is because many PD programs have already deprioritized the k review target, um, which is supported by the ISPD guidelines of not going for an actual target, but looking at the patient as a whole. So which CMS policies right now are the gatekeepers for any change? There's three that this paper outlines, and I want to talk about each of them uh, briefly. The first is the conditions of coverage. Then it's the, then it's the gatekeeper that I just talked about, the ESRD QIP, and the Medicare Claims Processing Manual. And if policy is new to anyone, the way that I like to think of it is that one of the rules of the, con the conditions of coverage one is the reporting, how things are actually reported and seen, it being the ESR to QIP. And the last one is the billing, being the Medicare Claims Processing Manual. So going first, I'm going to talk about the conditions of coverage. So the conditions of coverage, otherwise known as the CFC, is a federal mandate. If you look this up online, it's under the Code of Federal Reg Regulations, Title 42, Chapter 6. And these are standards for any medical organization participating in Medicare or Medicaid. And CMS justifies this by saying that these are health and safety standards that are the foundation for improving quality and protecting the health of safety beneficiaries. Now, CFCs apply to many healthcare organizations, not just ESRD. And you can see that in this, in this, um, in this list, there's, there's an array of different healthcare org organizations ESRD facilities or dialysis facilities just being one of them. The specific CFC regulation for peritoneal dialysis is, it's, it's mentioned twice as it pertains to KTRV. And the first one is how frequently KTRV should be calculated. What I haven't talked about thus far is that with every, with every CFC regulation, there's actually a guidance a guidance manual that is provided to dialysis facilities to best interpret what the regulation means. So the guidance, the, the interpretive guidance for this regulation is actually this set amount of paragraphs. I'm not gonna go through everything. And this is, this is not meant to be read out loud um, or even read as a whole, but the point I wanna make is that What's highlighted in blue is what is relevant to peritoneal dialysis, whereas the specific reg regulation is for peritoneal and hemodialysis as a broad umbrella. The second specific regulation is actually the target KTRV of at least 1.7. And again, there's a large, um, 
but there's a large instruction on how to actually interpret this reg reg regulation. As you look in the very bottom paragraph, you'll see that it talks about counseling patients on the importance of achieving this target and how it can be detrimental to their health. And I think kind of stepping back, this is an important, um, an important thing to understand that this actually gives the impression that patients should have a target of 1.7 or 1.2 for hemodialysis. And this KT over V target has specific clinical implications, um, which, which we know may not actually be true. The second gatekeeper policy is the ESRD QIP. So this is instituted by CMS to provide high quality services to dialysis facilities. And essentially they're, they're, they're measures that CMS looks at for dialysis facilities. And it ultimately affects how dialysis facilities get reimbursed. And for the most part, it's more of a penalty as it is to, um, as it is to a reward. And the maximum payment reduction by CMS to any facility can be up to 2%. Two, two How does it look at this? It looks at it through the lens of clinical measures and reporting measures. Clinical measures are essentially clinical outcomes, which can be based on meeting a specific number or target that, that's an achievement measure, or if this measure is better than last year, being an improvement measure. But there's specific values or numbers that that CMS will look at. The other one are reporting measures where essentially CMS just looks to see if dialysis facilities provided the information. KT over V is a clinical measure at this period of time. So, so, so CMS cares if your KT over V for peritoneal dialysis is a 1.7 or above. These are all the clinical measures and reporting measures for the ESRD QIP. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but what, what I wanna highlight is that in the, in, in the calendar year of 2023, there's actually some change. And a clinical measure doesn't always have to be a clinical measure. It can be changed to a reporting measure and vice versa. And this year, Hypercalcemia has been converted from a clinical measure to a reporting measure. And also a standard tran transfusion ratio is changed from a, uh, from a reporting measure to a clinical measure, um, which I don't wanna go on to, um, I don't wanna jump ahead too much, but potentially there is, there's, a, there's room or benefit of the target KTRV of 1.7, just being a reported measure of just reporting KTRV as opposed to being a target. And the last gatekeeper is the claims processing manual. And this one I'll go through quickly, but essentially it's, it's a, the ESRD portion is in chapter eight of this manual and it provides guidance on how claims should be structured. Um, and specifically it says that the date of last K2 reading or peritoneal dialysis, this date may, may be before the current billing period, but should be within four months of the claim date of service. So moving forward, the, the, primary, the, the primary point that this article is proposing is that it's having an alternative pathway to deprioritize a target KTRV. And by doing that, it's a three-pronged approach. Each one um, changing a specific aspect of a Medicare policy. So the first one being a CFC in that it, it appears to be that CMS is adhering more towards the 2006 KDOKI guidelines and is actually not as congruent with the ISP 2020 guidelines, which calls for deprioritizing a target k 2 v based on the evidence that we know. So what this is proposing is that there should be written guidance to, uh, to, to, to state to deprioritize a k 2 v target. The next one's the ESRD QIP, which I stated earlier, um, has is is reported based on clinical uh, uh, clinical measures and reporting measures, and this is proposing that we change KT over V from a clinical measure to a reporting measure in this alternative pathway. 
And lastly, for the claims processing manual, um, a change proposed is to actually have a different billing code for this alternative pathway, such that the alternative pathway is, is a treatment plan that can be created between the patient and dialysis providers such that they don't target a KTRV and the KTRV is, is, is reported, but the prescribed dialysis is more patient-centric um, based, based on patient symptoms and goals. So moving forward, the questions I ask is, which patients are best for the alternative pathway? Knowing what we know now about the limitations of KTRV, it's my personal opinion that most patients, if not all, should be on the alternative pathway. Next is increasing education and awareness on the limitation of KTRV targets. The most recent KDOPI guidelines were published in 2006, which were 23 years ago. So there's a whole generation of nephrologists which primarily associate peritoneal dialysis clearance and 1.7, but there's a lot more to that. Local advocacy, whether it's with, with, with peers, medical education or the dialysis facility, and then national advocacy, and, and furthermore, revisions of current guidelines, KDOKI being, being the most likely thing that should be revised. And then lastly, allowing for research between targeted KTRV and alternative path, uh, pathway ther therapy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amal, for uh, tackling this uh, challenging topic and, and providing a review of uh, some of the important studies and also talking about Dr. Reddy's recent article. I think I'll just open it up for discussion at this point uh, and just acknowledge a couple of things. One, that you know, Dr. Golper was involved in, in many of the Doki uh, recommendations over the years and I'm curious in what his, if he has uh, comments, thoughts to add to yours. And then obviously we have Dr. Reddy here and Yuvaram would love uh, kind of any comments you have uh, or just to start discussion. So uh, I put in the chat uh, and I didn't mean to confuse people, the argument of target versus uh, uh, minimal delivered dose. And Amal uh, actually, you got a little bit confused yourself with regards to that. So uh, that confusion has gone back since Doki started. So uh, Doki started in 95 and we had only observational data. And uh, uh, it was the 95 work group, it took uh, two years to get the product out, uh, is what stimulated the, Mexi the Atomex study, just so you know. And uh, so we, we achieved our goal there, but the problem was that we clinicians wanted uh, the concept of target. The Kidney Foundation did not settle for that. They wanted, they wanted uh, these absolute achieved things. And so we wanted to target to for uh, CAPD and 2.2 for uh, CCPD target, because you don't always hit the target, you see. Uh, and it morphed into a, uh, a demand. Now, to that said, uh, then in the, the, the first change was in 2000, and then the second change is, as Amal said, in 2006. But, but as, as Matt said, uh, I was the key writer I'm going to read you what what is in the uh, 1997 guidelines. I'm going to read. It's only a few sentences. These guidelines are intended for use by healthcare professionals trained to understand variations in the practice of medicine and the necessity for such variation. These guidelines are not intended for punitive use by any oversight official who does not understand the reason or the necessity for practice variations, including variations in societies differ from that of the United States. And uh, the Kidney Foundation was so enamored with uh, CMS paying attention to their product that they let that go, okay? And that is why uh, Dr. Reddy's uh, it, it, it paper is the first decent paper articulating how we can get out of this. 
and uh, so uh, I'll turn it over to him. Uh, uh, but my my response is, you're right, and good luck. <laughs> Yuvram, uh, I don't know if you want to take us through kind of what your inspiration was for this and and how this paper got put together. Sure, I'm happy to talk more. I'd also love to hear more from others about this because I feel like there is there is and has been a great deal of controversy about all this. Now, but my first question is, Amol, do, is it Amol or Amol? I want to make sure I'm pronouncing your name right. It's Amol. Amol, okay. Uh, it's nice to meet you. Thank you so much for choosing to present this. I, uh, me, I and my co-authors when we embarked on writing about this weren't sure how it would be received, how much interest there might be. So I am touched that you chose to, to take on this topic that is sort of very niche, but also I feel very passionately about. Um, I'm not, uh, I still don't have a good sense on how the community views what we've written and what next steps are. Um, but I am grateful that you interpreted what we wrote and shared your findings, which sort of, I think align with what we were saying. So I feel like that's good writing on our first author's part. Um, but um, we felt like the ISPD guidelines seemed very holistic and patient-centered. Uh, and that although folks like Tom and Joel uh, and Isaac talked about how at Home Dialysis University, you shouldn't rely on KTRV for an individual patient, you shouldn't rely more on everything else about them. <laughs> Uh, we were still stuck in this position. And so we were trying to brainstorm what are some practical ways to help us move towards uh, a path to follow the ISPD guidelines that didn't require an act of Congress to change the conditions for coverage that haven't been touched since 2008. Um, so when we looked back, we saw this clause in the conditions for coverage, and we thought, well, that's a way to try to create this pathway. Um, and uh, I guess the last thing I'll say for now is we are meeting we're meeting with CMS in about two weeks, the authors of the paper, to try to discuss what amongst any of this is practical and when what what would they be willing to do next. So I'd really love to hear from other folks about what controversies might exist in trying to take away KTRV targets of 1.7. This is an incredible opportunity. If anyone has comments for Dr. Reddy, who has a meeting on the books with CMS to talk about this. So um Tom, go you've ahead. Run, you've, it, it's not a target of 1.7. That's a that's a minimal dose. There's a you you made the same that we had that problem for 20 some years now. So, but but let everybody make a distinction between minimal dose that we think you should deliver total of 1.7 because we feel that way. That's that's kidney plus PD, uh, and that has to go to, to some of the stuff in that Amal discussed. But uh, that's the difference between target and target. If you target one seven, what some 20, 30 percent will be under that, you see. So be be careful with your words. I agree. And that's a good uh, point for me about even if we were to move towards this world of an alternative pathway, what are the potential unintended consequences of how we frame things and what could come next? I'm curious, uh, Yuvram or, or Tom or others, you know, if um, in thinking about this and looking back at the writing of the most recent iteration of the conditions for coverage now, 15 years ago, is it clear why, for example, a KTRV target made into the conditions for coverage and not other clinic, you know, target clinical parameters or minimal threshold clinical parameters? Like why? adequacy or small solute clearance as opposed to anything else that that we do in dialysis sort of acknowledging that you know the conditions for coverage is not a quality program it is a congressional mandate a law that says what must be provided by dialysis facilities to get paid by medicare uh, i don't know what you, if you have thoughts about that uh first of all it doesn't matter whether it's hemo or pd there is not a kt over v that is some magical number so it's all opinion. And, and why is CMS doing anything punitive based on opinion? With all due respect to Jenny Shen's opinion, uh, it shouldn't determine what I get paid for or not get paid for. And so, uh, Matt, I, I think that uh, I, I, I told you my explanation for it. 
The, the Kidney Foundation was trying to be uh, the go-to body for CMS and they let it get out of hand. And that's why KT over V, whether it's in hemo or PD, uh, got thrown in. And I just say, thank goodness that you, Rum, and his team are trying to separate out uh, uh, clinical parameters versus other. Uh, uh, I'll leave it at that. That, that. I think that there is an explanation, and I'm, I'm not proud of the explanation, but but I'm right about it. Uh, so I mean, the question that I have is, what type of communication goes on between different guidelines um, as they come out uh, between the Kidney Foundation and the ISPD? Uh, because first, first and foremost, the Kidney Found Foundation's guidelines haven't been updated since since 2006, um, whereas I ISPD, it seems like um, every few years there seems to be something, and um, something such as KTRV is is um, it's such a um, like like it shouldn't be a con um, a controversial thing, but it's now now becoming something because of these discrepancies. First of all, there's a lot of components of of guideline development that haven't been mentioned. Uh, in guideline development, you can update them, and you can sunset them. Okay, now, unfortunately, you can't retract them. Because one of the things that we uh, we doctors said is that uh, uh, we need to retract the guidelines so that uh, uh, CMS has nothing to stand on. You, there's no such thing as retracting guidelines. You either update them or sunset them. Okay, and that was a, a, a policy initiative that uh, uh, the NKF was not wanting to get into. It's about money for one thing. Uh, th there was no funding to update the guidelines, nor did they need to be updated because as you've mentioned and is discussed in his paper, uh, Isaac and Joel and Jenny, are you on that paper that uh, the, the American view of, uh, uh, and, and th that's the American view. And, uh, uh, but there are other players involved here, okay? And, whether you guys want to know all this stuff or not, you might as well grow up and hear it. Some of the other players are the LDOs. The LDOs uh, would put out press releases saying, well, we did this. This is our, our quality incentive program. Look how good we are. And, and we're better than that other LDO because our KT over Vs are 1.8 and theirs are 1.78. So we're superior to them. So it, it isn't just CMS that's playing this game. There are a lot of other people playing this game. And that is why I personally was so excited about uh, Reddy's proposal because it does offer CMS some outs. And good luck with your meeting. I meant that sincerely. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a famous quote, the best way to win an argument is start out by being right, okay? And you're right. So stick with it and thank goodness that you and Eric and, and uh, your other colleague looked for uh, mechanisms within the system. So I'll, I'll back off now. Dr. Matthew? Yeah, I, I mean, I, this is a great discussion. I, and just to play de uh, devil's advocate. Um, so let's say CMS says, well, how do I know my money is being well spent? So, you know, you can say that, um, you know, in hemo, a potential alternative is UF rate per hour. So what do we use as an alternative? I know, Dr. Rivara, you asked this question, and maybe I just wanted to see if there's some specifics. Can you use KDQOL if if the patient's symptoms are important? Can you use a, a, a like a aggregate of hemoglobin, phosphorus? I mean, what would be used in PD then? I would say I'm glad you brought up sort of the devil's advocate position, because if you didn't, I was going to ask how do people feel about removing this because it's controversial. Um, personally, I feel like in the US, we are very centered on this metric. And so to not have the metric is, is challenging. But every other country practices without that metric and is OK. And do we really need another metric to replace this? Uh, perhaps we could use quality of life and mortality and technique failure, 
only some of these can be actually measured in US RDS data. Uh, but if we were to do something like quality of life, would we'll then require more measurement, which is a struggle with nursing shortages. Um, to me, I'm not sure we need something to replace it because we have enough evidence to suggest that that's not necessary. Uh, but I recognize that not everyone feels that way. And I'm curious how others feel. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll i just add some thoughts. I mean, I my caveat is, uh, Yuvaram, I completely agree with your whole position. As another devil advocate, right, like, the concern is if you take away some adequacy target that dialysis facilities will, for financial reasons, provide less than adequate dialysis to save money. So, you know, it's perhaps more obvious in the hemodialysis setting where half an hour of time is, is translated into X number of dollars, right, for each dialysis treatment. For PDS, let's obvious that there's that direct uh, relationship. I mean, certainly PD fluid costs a little bit of money. So if you're gonna, you know, maybe save money, you could reduce the number of liters of dineal that you're using. Um, but to me, it's not quite as obvious. But I think I could see that being, you know, an argument that they come back at you with is to say, you know, we need this to ensure that our beneficiaries are getting uh, high quality dialysis. That, that's, you know, again, I don't believe what I just said, but I'm just saying it out there. And that's something I've heard from folks when we were drafting this, uh, which I am not sure seems sensible. It, 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 as you're saying, it's different for hemo versus PD because hemo is like tightly regulated in the dialysis unit. You know, people are prescribing these things and there's a certain uh, financial incentive or lack of disincentive to, um, minimize the number of hours in a session, maximize the number of people going through, but that doesn't necessarily exist with PD. Um, so I have a hard time with that concept. It also, this is very uh, a simplistic comparison, but like for heart failure, we don't have people regulating how many diuretics need to be prescribed and what the weight ought to be. We don't have quality metrics for that. And, and, and should we? I, probably not. Um, so why is PD held to such a different standard for something that is so loosely tied to quality as KT or V. It's, it's not clear to me. Um, we, there's often a stance of like, if there's a pro, there's a con, there must be a debate. If we're going to take away KT or V, what goes in its place? And it's 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 hard to battle that. So uh, let, let me, uh, I agree with that question. Let me just say historically, uh, that is why uh, we had a minimum uh, recommendation in DOKI. That, that's why is so that there is some uh, uh, answer uh, to CMS asking the question, what are we getting for our money? However, I, I pose this, the same same uh, a devil's advocate question. Why is that our job? C CMS uh, agreed to pay for this service. Okay, what, why is it our job to determine that they're going to pay for it or not when they've already said they're going to pay for it. I mean, they didn't put any stipulations in the original uh, HR1 back in, uh, uh, what was that, 72 or so. There was no stipulation that said that. Uh, uh, the, the conditions of coverage uh, 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 advocate that the governing body and the medical director, particularly the medical director, oversee the quality. Well, okay, so if the medical director is going to oversee the quality, why is that coming out of Baltimore? The, the medical director of, of Matt's uh, PD program is uh, uh, Matt or one of his colleagues. So uh, 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 e either you, you hire a medical director and you get the job done. Now, let me just say further, if, if I inadequately dialyze people, they're going to be in the hospital. I don't get, as a facility, I don't get revenue when they're in the hospital. I only get revenue when they're not. Uh, if they dialyze for one year and die, I put in a tremendous investment into teaching them how to do dialysis only to have them die and I lose all that revenue after one year. So if there's a financial incentive, it's to keep them out of the hospital and to keep them alive as long as possible. And who's responsible for that? 
The quality of care is, is, is under the responsibility of the medical director. So, so you've run, I mean, I, I would use these arguments when you're talking to them. Okay, and, and if the medical director, if you wanna put standards on the medical director, I'm all for that. But to me, the, the, the determ just like internationally, uh, if you look at the ties, they want to, to control uh, what they do in Hong Kong, in Singapore, they all wanna control what they do. Same thing's true locally. Matt Rivara should be, be uh, uh, in charge of what's being done in Seattle, Jenny in UCLA, uh, you and Joel and your colleagues at, at in in Philly, you know, local. That you, you're paying a medical director. You're paying them good money. So let's do your job. I guess you, Brian. I, I mean, you mentioned um, that they had moved hypercalcemia, for example, from something that they had to um, uh, achieve to reporting. Did they replace it with anything else, or can? You know, similar logic be used there. Right, they haven't replaced it with anything else. If I recall in their uh, public letter about it, they talked about how they're developing new measures to replace it. And I suspect it might be hyperphosphatemia because they are mandated to have some sort of mineral bone disease metric, but I'm just speculating. I don't actually know what it will be. Um, so it's possible again to say, we can suppress this, which it's, it's already suppressed because of the COVID-19 pandemic anyway. So no one is being measured against or, or penalized for a KTV goal of 1.7 right now, but uh, minimum dose of 1.7 right now. Um, but what's the alternative, right? If we're going to suppose say there should be an alternative, in my view, the alternative is creating an alternative pathway and then having people funnel through that. And then maybe that pathway grows based on the number of people who feel comfortable prescribing in that alternative pathway. Um, but um, what sort of safeguards exist to protect patients, I think is a lot, is one other viewpoint that we haven't talked about here. Uh, many people in this room here uh, would practice high quality goal directed PD, but what might happen in the community where there are folks who are underprepared to provide PD uh, and what will they do to their patients is, is the bigger worry that I've heard. Um, and I'm not, and, th and that's one of the reasons why people think that we should keep KTRV of 1.7 because it forces a minimum standard of dialysis. I'm not sure that that's a good argument to say that we should be delivering 1.7. Uh, but of course, I'm clearly biased. But to say like we should deliver 1.7 PD for everyone because we can't train nephrologists to provide high quality patient-centered PD doesn't seem like the right approach to this. Dr. Eddy, I have a question for you, um, kind of more from a financial aspect, uh, playing, playing also devil's advocate. Um, what percentage of dialysis facilities um, don't meet that 1.7? And how many get deducted by 2%? Um, because the reason I ask that is because once you go into an, to an alternative pathway, that doesn't exist. And that's more money that CMS has to spend. Um, yeah, you know, I, I actually don't know the answer to that. I know that that PD clinics are 13 times more likely to not meet their target for uh, patients, for more than 10% of patients, I think, then that's what Eric Weinhandel had pulled out from dialysis facility compare for us for this study. So I don't know. Um, it, it, I don't know all, the all about how CMS operates, but I feel like the people who are enforcing the quality metrics, enforcing is the wrong word, developing the quality metrics, are different from the people who care about what the, how much is saved versus lost. Um, and because they're fragmented in that way, I'm not sure that the, CIA, the people who are thinking about alternative measures will care as much about finances here. Um, but I might poke around and get back to you in a few minutes. I think one of the one of the challenges, Yvram, of the KTRV is it's so heavily entrenched and in different aspects of dialysis policy. So it's kind of the only metric I can think of that is specifically stated in the conditions for coverage. It's a measure in the ESRD QIP and it's reported on dialysis facility compare, right? So it's like, and if you don't remove it from all three of those things, the incentives for dialysis facilities are gonna remain the same because at least I know my dialysis organization, they care a lot about the star ratings. We get emailed about those all the time. And then of course, from a QIP perspective, 2% of many millions of dollars is a lot of money. So um, 
I don't have a question for you. I was just saying it's, it's sort of of all the quality measures, it's in some ways like the one that's most heavily entrenched in our system. So Matt, do you have uh, patients that uh, inquire about which of your units has the higher star rating and they'll go to the unit with the higher star rating? Have you had that experience? Yeah, I mean, I think you're, I don't know. My sense is you're asking a facetious question, but because no, I mean, I've never had a patient even acknowledge that that thing exists. Looks like Dr. Zhang has had a patient. Um, but I think the other challenge in the current era is uh, patients, because of staffing shortages, have no actual uh, choice about which dialysis facility they go to. They have to go to the one with the first available chair. But it looks like at least a couple of patients have, uh, or a couple of people here, including Jenny, have had uh, patients ask about star ratings. Can we hear about that, Jenny? Anybody? Uh, uh, tell me the uh, patient experience with star ratings. So usually what happens is if the patient crashes into dialysis, then the social worker will let them know which ones are the closest dialysis units to them. And a lot of times when they pull it up on the internet, um, they'll see the star ratings on there. Sometimes make choices based on that. They do. They do make choices based on that. Not often, but sometimes. Okay, because I have yet to see it and I've been doing this for a long, long time. So Jenny, uh, how often do you think, uh, are we looking at 1% of people make that decision? Because uh, the uh, to me, I, I've not seen it. I, I'm actually not sure what percentage it would be. The, the other question about um, metrics is, you know, we have to also take into consideration that if we start seeing things like phosphorus come into play, that is not always under our control. And it's gonna become really difficult to meet those kind of metrics. And that's why, you know, at least in HEMO, k review was wonderful because it was very much under our control. But I mean, if we start pulling things like phosphorus, you know, 90% of our, I mean, not 90%, but I mean, a lot of our patients are just not gonna meet those targets. And again, the phosphorus is purely speculative. I have no idea what CMS will actually do. I also want to make sure that I, I actually think that a, a minimal KT over V is appropriate. I, I'm talking about targeting high KT over Vs. There, even even the uh, uh, the ISPD still uh, 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 would like for you to get a KT over V up into some range. Uh, uh, and the American response, which uh, uh, Teitelbaum and what I think Teitelbaum and Glickman were the first two authors on that, uh, and I agree with them that I don't think there should be a, a, a carte blanche, but but there is if you've got if the patient's best wishes are the highest, and you're doing some form of palliative PD to get uh, 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 Mrs. Smith because she wants to see her granddaughter's wedding next summer. There's no reason she has to have a high KT over V. She she needs enough to get her through what her goals are. So there's there doesn't have to be a conflict between goal directed care and a KT over V. It's just that the KT over V has to be not punitive. There's a, there's a big difference there. I don't think we should go away from recommending a minimal delivered KT over V. The difference is I don't think units should be punished for not getting there. On the other hand. If a patient doesn't have a K2 over V of 1.7, why isn't there a note explaining it? This is palliative dialysis. This has got uh, some other reasons. There, the the, the uh, abdominal space is too tight, okay? There could be all kinds of reasons. All, all CMS wants is an, is an explanation for why you're delivering the care the way you are. And that's where we have failed. At, as a community, we haven't explained it very well. But it, but but the answer is not this line in the sand that you either you you get paid or you don't get paid for a line in the sand. That that's a terrible idea. Yeah, I th yeah, agreed. And I think it it is this sort of perpetual challenge in medicine is like the difference between clinical practice and guidelines and performance metrics, and that concept gets confused by the government. Uh, whereas obviously with with us, it's more clear. <laughs> All right, so you're going to get me going again because I was involved in guidelines. When guidelines were proposed, 
performance measures had to be attached to the guideline. Had to be, okay? That was part of the rules. If you guys look at the history of guideline development, absolutely, Matt, you're right. And, and that's where the problem with the NKF trying to be on the good side of CMS, that's where the problem was, was in performance measures. We wanted to write our own performance measures. All right, well, people are falling off the call here because it's after 1.30. Appreciate uh, Amal, you presenting this challenging topic. Uh, Yuvaram, thank you for uh, contributing this article to the literature and um, I think supporting what, what many of us believe in your uh, talks with CMS. So thank you for doing that and good luck, as Tom said, in your meeting. Appreciate everyone being here. Our next uh, journal club, I believe, although we'll send an email, I believe is May 8th also at 12.30 uh, p.m. And hope everyone has a good rest of their week.